Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Well, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Becky Metcalf, and on behalf of Design Centre Chelsea Harbour, a very warm welcome to our Conversations in Craft sessions. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of housekeeping first. If I could ask you just to turn off your phones because we're recording the session, that would be wonderful. Well, we are in for a treat. We really are. We have got Julian Stair here uh, this afternoon. Um, he is a leading potter, a writer, an absolute authority on ceramics. He's exhibited internationally, and it's simply amazing that he's here with us today. Who better to speak to him than Grant Gibson? Of course, the writer and, of course, podcaster. You probably know his, his brilliant podcast, Material Matters. Let's give them both a very warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Nice to see an audience here. Um, yeah, as Becky said, I'm here to talk to Julian Stair. My name is Grant Gibson. Uh, Julian, who I'm sure you'll know, but uh, was a recipient of an OBE this year. Congratulations. What I know. <laughs> One of our leading potters for the last 30 years. And I think importantly also um, a fine writer and historian, which we will uh, endeavor to unpick. We're going to talk for about 40 minutes about Julian's uh, career, his relationship with his material of choice, which is clay, uh, his relationship with prose, um, and you know, possibly the future as well. But then after that, it would be wonderful if we could have a few questions from the audience. So Becky will be running around with a microphone. And if you have any questions, start thinking of them, start them percolating as we're talking, because I'm sure yours will be better than mine. Um, so we'll kick off in that case. Thank you very much for doing this, Julian. I mean, can, can we talk in the first instance? You emailed me yesterday, and you were saying that you were in a, a, a brick factory. Um, what were you doing in a brick factory? Um, I've decided to work at scale again for the first time in a decade or so, 11, 12 years. Um, and I'm making some very large work um, in brick factories where I've made large work before. And the reason I work in brick factories is practical on many levels. They have large kilns, they have forklift trucks which can pick up things that weigh three, 400 kilos. Um, but more to the point, um, depending on the factory, they have um, often a range of rather beautiful clays which are natural clays, they're not processed, they're quarried on site, and therefore they're clays which have um, very beautiful qualities, qualities of color, qualities of texture. And um, brick factories are very good at making bricks, which are very durable. And so all in all, um, it's basically a marriage of studio skills, but transported to an industrial environment um, so I'm taking my kind of studio, my wheels, my equipment, and working in this environment that really just facilitates the making of work that I wouldn't normally be able to make. Right. What do they make of you? I mean, presumably there are lots of people there, or some people there, making bricks. And here you are making something else. Well, how, how does your presence go down, I wonder? It's a good question. Um, an aspect of it is it's a very, very sharp introduction to the, the reality of industrial life. I've worked in four brick factories now, three in Britain, one in Denmark. And I have to say, and I'm sorry to differentiate, but the, the nature of working in industrial life in Britain is leave something to be desired. It's very hard work. It's a kind of effectively um, a white male working class industrial culture. Um, it's kind of quite narrow. Uh, it's incredibly poorly paid. And very often people are treated pretty poorly by the corporate structures that run the factories. And I feel very, I feel a kind of heightened sense of privilege doing what I do and doing it in that environment, which is often a complete kind of contrast. Mm. So it raises all sorts of social, <laughs> political pressures. But I really do empathize with the 
people on the shop floor, people who do the work. They're working with the same material that I'm working with. Um, it's manual work. Uh, they wear overalls, I wear overalls. Often there's a kind of, uh, if this is too long an answer. No, this stop is me. good. This is good. Often there's a differential between suits and overalls. Yeah. I, I, metaphorically, I don't wear suits, but metaphorically I'm in the suit category, but I'm also in the overall category. And I feel, I feel a, a kind of a bond with the, with the guys on the shop floor who don't have the opportunities that I've had in life. Do they feel a bond with you, do you think? I try and establish a bond, and mm. I don't mean to be patronizing, but one thing I do do is I do throwing lessons there. Okay. Because they're incredibly generous with their time and with their help. And the particular factory I work in, I worked at a lot for a big exhibition I did 11, 12 years ago called uh, Quiet. Which we will come on to. And um, I've gone back to the same factory. It was a very, very nice atmosphere. Mm. And the person who runs the section is actually innately kind of creative which is not something that you can kind of say for a lot of corporate kind of commercial production. Um, and there's more, there's more kind of connecting us than separating us, mm. if that makes sense. <clears throat> so um, at one factory up in Walsall, I've introduced throwing to lots of people over the years, but there was one, there was one guy, so it's a tiny story. And he used to secretly make things and then feed them into the kilns. He couldn't do this openly. So, so, he so he'd be making pots? Or? He, he was just making things, which he then sold on eBay. Oh, okay. And All it right. was a kind of latent, latent creativity that somehow just came out. Mm. And he, you know, he couldn't contain. And... He was so enthusiastic and keen to see what I was doing. And when, and as I said, I give throwing lessons because it's a way of reciprocating. Uh, and when I gave a throwing lesson to him, his facility, I'm not one for saying, you know, art is about God-given talent. I think it's, you know, hard work. You know, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, which I think Matisse said. But um, this guy had just an incredible, the, the most kind of innate facility I'd had, but he hadn't gone to art college. He hadn't had all the mm. opportunities that, you know, I, I, I very fortunately had. Mm. So it throws, up, it throws up all sorts of wider questions as well on a social, political level, as well as on a kind of creative level. Yeah, yeah. And in a very different way, it's been an interesting start to the year, OBE. I mean, does, does these, how does this work? You, you get a letter that's completely out of the blue saying, oh, and by the way. Uh, yes, it was out of the blue uh, with some formal cabinet secretary stamp or whatever. Um, and it came out, yes, it came out of the blue. And then the question is to accept it or not. And there was you already, Had you not already accepted an MBE? No, I no, you that. went straight to the OBE. Oh, wow. So the question was to accept it or not. And I did think long and hard about that. And there were kind of pros and cons of potentially doing that. But one of the reasons I did, and I, I, um, I, I, I think craft practice, ceramic practice is really, really important. And in the end, I thought, if there's more kind of official, if you like, acknowledgement, more mm. institutional validation of the medium and the way I work, which I share with, you know, fellow, you know, fellow practitioners, then, you know, it's probably worthwhile accepting it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that. I mean, can we talk about your, your background, Julian? Take, we've, we've gone to the beginning of this year. Let's go back to... Well, your relationship with clay, when did you first pick up a piece of clay and think, oh, this is interesting? I remember very <clears> clearly, <throat> actually. Um, I did terribly at school. Right. And it, uh, when I was at school, which was a very long time ago, um, dyslexia wasn't known about. So I f failed exams 
from you know uh, eleven. What was the exam you do at eleven plus? That the old one. Well, it used to be eleven plus. Yes, the eleven plus. I failed that, and I did terribly with O levels and CSEs and and scraped a series of exams to go to college. So school was a pretty miserable experience, but at the age seven, and I do remember this really clearly, teachers gave us a lump of clay and said, I'd like, we'd, she'd like us to make a figure. And she said, try and make the figure from one piece of clay, not sticking bits together. And anyway, I thought, okay, well, that's quite simple. <laughs> So I kind of make the rough figure shape and then you know, I divided the legs and then put kind of div and I did that. And I was, is, is the first time I ever got praised and probably the last time for another decade <laughs> as well. And um, I do believe that practitioners, artists uh, should be able to justify their work, they should be able to contextualize it within contemporary practice, they should be able to contextualize it within historical practice. In other words, you, the onus is on you to be as kind of informed and knowledgeable and as possible. But there's some things which I can't put into words. Mm. And it is about a relationship with material and fingers. And my favorite word is kind of haptical, haptic which is the Greek uh, derivation of, well, it's, it's a Greek equivalent to, say, optic. So optical experience is you experience the world visually through, through your optics, and haptical experience is you experience the world physically through touch. And there's something about clay as a material which I can't, I can't express. But that's because I think it's very much an embodied mm. process. Mm. And and embodiment is very elusive in terms of language. Um, we have very poor vocabulary for talking about touch and physical experience. Um, and it doesn't have a very high profile, not only in our modern world, but certainly in the visual art world. The term visual art, in a way, <laughs> excludes the material and the mm. physical, just the actual title. So there's something about the material of clay and the ability to, uh, to, to kind of express yourself and put ideas into, into form through, through material. And clay is an, an extraordinary material because it's got this incredible malleability, um, so it can be super expressive if you want it to be, but if you, work, if you understand it and you work with it, then you can make all sorts of things. Mm. So from, uh, so anyway, uh, see, my, I'm fading, my words are fading me here. Well, no, it's, I'm intrigued, I mean, did, were your family as a child, I mean, you talked about school, but at home, were you encouraged to make, were your parents behind this as a, as a, as a thing? Oh my God, so, uh, well, this is the way <coughs> therapy takes over, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... I had kind of parents from the 50s and the 60s who were, I think, pretty disengaged. I think they were more concerned with their own problems in life than, than my brother and I. We kind of got on, we got on our own, yeah. really. Uh, we were left on our own and we got on our own. Um, I have to say that there was, my family was involved in creative practice in the widest sense of the word. Um, my brother became a musician, I became. I became a potter. Mm. Mm. And but let, let's get so let's get you to that potting stage because you've you've picked up a piece of clay. You can't explain it, but there's a kind of there's obviously a relationship that that sounds pretty immediate. It's like a Damazine moment. Um, when did you think you could turn this into a profession? I mean, did you, you went to Camberwell, but was that? Did you think then I'm going to be a professional potter? Was that? Was well, that after the start? seven years old, I didn't touch clay for until I was in uh, <clears throat> my final t years of school. So reluctantly, or well not reluctantly, I belatedly came to art as a school subject because, there'd be, as I said, there'd been kind of creative practice mm. in my family and you kind of rebel against that as a kind of automatic thing. But I gave in eventually. And then um, I had a very uh, extraordinary teacher who was 
highly temperamental and blue hot and cold <laughs> and one minute you'd be a kind of blue eyed people <coughs> and the next minute you'd be at the bottom of the class and um, I started off quite well and then I just progressively went down and down and, I, and my school had there was a little pottery room and I said could I make some pots and she said no 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 and then eventually yes, she became so disillusioned but yes I'll go, I'll go <laughs> off you go and then then I became a blue eyed pupil again and again, um, <clears throat> I don't know, I somehow, I, I, my fingers somehow work with clay. And I'm sorry for being so inarticulate on that front. No, it's fine. You're not being inarticulate at all. But, um, so then, then it was obvious from school that Camberwell was going to be the, the place to go. I applied to do foundation, but I said at my foundation interview, they said, do you want to, you know, do you know what you think you're going to do, you know, at, you know, for your kind of degree mm. level? And I said, ceramics, that's what I want to do. And I did ceramics as my option throughout foundation. And I, and I had a very, very orthodox, a very conventional kind of urban metropolitan training. I always think is a strange term to use for art college. But um, um, I went to Camberwell uh, and then I went to the RCA. In between that, I had a year off and I went and worked for a very traditional leech potter. Right, in, interesting. In St. Just, which is about the next headland up from Land's End. So it really is that kind of leech rural, supposedly that leech rural. Did, did you choose that or were you sent there? I mean, is this, I'm, I'm interested to know, was that the kind of work you were interested I took a in year making? Off. I, I asked my head of department because <clears throat> I went straight from school. I applied for college thinking I'd do what my university friends mm. would, who, you know, friends who are applying to university, which you'd get your course and then you'd have a year off to, you know, experience the world. But Campbell, the head of foundation, said he didn't agree with experiencing life with a capital L and I had to accept <laughs> my place or give it up. So I was too nervous to give it up. But then after I did my first year of my ceramics degree, I didn't just want to kind of go through from primary school to secondary school to foundation. It's just one long treadmill. So I took a year off and my head of department, who was a very well-known figure in ceramics called Ian Old, was wise and generous enough to allow mm. me to do so. And I ended up living in Cornwall and I worked part-time for a potter called Scott Marshall, who was the nephew of Bill Marshall, who was the foreman of the Leech Pottery for about 50 years. Mm. And Scott Marshall, so much for the rural little. He was living in absolute rural squalor, and he was a cantankerous old alcoholic <laughs> bastard. <laughs> Happy year then? But I learned, I learned a huge amount, not directly, but indirectly. Right. And there were things I didn't, I saw, but I didn't understand, but they came back to me later on. And I was- Such as, can you pinpoint anything? <sighs> no, the kind of intangibles. Mm. It's maybe the way in which, you know, a form, you know, is constructed or, you know, parts joined together, or maybe, they're intangibles. It's, mm. this is the haptical realm, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the elusive realm again. But, um, and I was far too, you know, ignorant to kind of plan this out, but, you know, from, from kind of, you know, London Art School, which was, when I was there, it was Camberwell School of Arts and Crafts, uh, before it became amalgamated, and then a university. And so to go from the London School, uh, London Art School, to, to uh, this kind of rural, environment and then back to London and then going on to the RCA which again I was very privileged privileged to go to and in those days it was a three-year degree a three-year course which is just you know extraordinary by today's mm. standards mm. so I'm kind of slightly embarrassed in a way because I had seven years of full-time funded education where not only we didn't pay fees but we got grants yeah those were the days eh um uh well, let's talk about what your work, because we, we're watching kind of uh, a, a loop of your work as it stands, and those are the mid-sized pots we were talking about. They're not big, by the way, people. Those are mid-sized pots. Um, but what did your work look like, kind of leaving Camberwell and into the Royal College of Art? I mean, where you, you formed? 
as, a, as an artist? No, the first two images, which we've gone through, but there were two uh, kind of, there was an abstract sculpture. I left Campbell making abstract sculpture. Right. And I'd said, t I think there's a pressure on students at art school to perform, to kind of perform in a way that you develop something, it's a kind of individual identity. And I developed this work and it seemed, it was well received. But I did say to them, it's not enough for me. I kind of, I wanted to make parts, but I was very young and inarticulate in one thing and another. And I didn't necessarily have the means to put things into the thoughts or feelings, I should say, into words. And uh, there we go. That's, that's an abstract. So that's, ah, a, okay. that's a freestanding mm -hmm. relief. So the idea, so it's all about optical illusion and, of course, it's very much a product of the <coughs> 1970s and minimalism. I was a product of, you know, that era in mm. art, and that's the second piece there. Thank you for bringing those <laughs> images back, by the way. But I, I went to, uh, when I was interviewed to go to college, I said, I'm not going to make this work anymore. And they said, well, what are you going to make? And I said, I'm going to make parts. Well, can you show us? No, because I don't know what I'm going to make. Which was a really reckless thing to say. Mm. But I sent myself back to the beginning again when I went to the RCA, and the course was long enough to be able to do. And I, I knew I wanted to make parts, and I pinched, and I coiled, and I slabbed, and I even did turning on a horizontal lathe, the kind of industrial method. And eventually, I settled on throwing, just because it's a brilliant way of working, mm. not because I have a kind of, um, you know, a kind of ideological stance about throwing. It's just a phenomenally kind of amazing way of working in terms of making vessels or pots. Why pots? I mean, is it to do with functionality? Was that the desire? I hate the word function because it's a really reductive term. And it is a reductive term that reduces things down to a very base mechanical level. Yeah, yeah. So apologies if that's a strong <laughs> response. No, no. I can look at that. I, I, the, the idea of use is incredibly important. Mm. So using work, for me, art that engages in life is extraordinarily complex and extraordinarily interesting. And I think, I can't say because it's about other people's response, but I think that art that can be used and engaged, so we have a teapot and two cups, that teapot pours tea, the cups hold the tea. Do people pour tea with that teapot, though? Probably uh, occasionally, if at all. But everything I make can pour, well, every teapot I make can pour mm. tea, and it you know, is glazed on the inside. That's really important, because it's also tying into a tradition, or a tradition, a history, you know, of 10, 15,000 years of vessel making. And that is one of the great kind of genres of human, human identity, civilization. I was very lucky at the RCA, I came, I met someone called Philip Rawson. And if any of you are interested, go and search for his book, it's Philip Rawson, R-A-W-S-O-N, a book called Ceramics, simply part of a series of books that were published by Oxford University Press in the 70s under the appreciation of the arts. He wrote one on ceramics and he wrote one on, one on drawing. And Philip was a polymath. He was just an amazing figure. And the, my formative years were the 70s and the kind of 80s, mm. really. And the ceramic world was a very weird world. It was kind of traditionists versus progressives, you know, pot makers versus what then became vessel. You know, the vessel, the idea of the non-functional vessel. Well, the generation before yours would have been, I guess, the Alison Britons, the Carol McNichols. That was very much the generation. Yeah. That, because they were products of the 70s. Yes. And I was just a little bit behind them. Whose work was very different from what you, uh, what you did. <coughs> I wanted to make pots, but I didn't want to make pots within that very kind of strict leech school. Mm. I didn't want to make anglo or or Anglo-Oriental pots. I didn't want to make the kind of formulaic ash glaze or temiku or, you know, do the brushwork. I was drawn to pots, but I didn't quite know why. Philip showed me, and his book will show you, the extraordinary history that ceramics has played in human culture, because it, he goes back through the millennia. And the 
the first section in the book is called the existential base. It's nothing to do with use or, you know, whatever function. It's not to do with, you know, modernism or, you know, postmodernism. It is, it goes back. Mm. And when you think about the, the role that pots have played in human culture across the whole world, and I kind of realized that everything, right, clay is made of silica. Silica is 60% of the Earth's crust. It's the most commonly available material there is in terms of, well, one of the most commonly available. And when you think about every single culture in the world that we know, with probably the exception of the far north where you have permafrost and you can't dig clay, every single culture we know, maybe Aboriginal culture, I'm not so hot on that, but every culture has utilized clay in some ways because it's commonly available. And they've utilized clay nine times, or the majority of times, to make domestic forms, which have use. One of the reasons I don't like the term functional is because you show me a purely functional pot. I challenge you to show me something that is only functional. Mm. Every functional, every, every pot, every vessel that can be used is going to have some element of it, uh, in it that it represents the creativity, the expressiveness of the maker, the culture that they come from. And Philip kind of opened up this world, which bypassed all of the narrowness of the, you know, the traditionists or the progressives, yeah. you know, the, the, the potters, the bearded, besmocked. Yes. The sandal The leech in rural tradition yeah. compared to the kind of what had been the kind of, well, I guess postmodern, Alison and, post and, and Carol. It was postmodernity. Yeah. yeah. Seb with crazy. Very cat. urban and, and with function kind of, which we, a word I'm never going to use again, but I've just used it. Function kind of, trying to find the outer limits of, of, of function in Alison's case, famously. Well, many of that, much of that work was making references to mm. a function. Mm. Now, when you're making <clears throat> references to things, in my book, you're not engaging with them. Mm. So I wrote a piece in Crafts, a uh, comment, comment piece in the 80s. And it was pretty crudely written, but the, 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 the germ of the idea was that a teapot is a teapot because it holds and pours tea. A teapot that is non-functional isn't a teapot. It's an idea about a teapot. Now, if you think that's a kind of philosophical argument about semantics, fine. But I think actually there's a very, very <coughs> important idea there. And one of the reasons why I was drawn in a dumb, on a, a dumb inarticulate way to pots at the beginning was because it was the hat to call experience. Yeah. And as human beings, we're physical creatures. We live in a material world. <coughs> And ceramics and other craft materials draw on that and, and utilize it. You're right. Sorry, there is a, <laughs> there's a, there's a cough. Excuse I've given me. you my cough. <laughs> so you have an art form that you can engage with with your eye by sight, you can engage with by your hand. When you use it, and with pots, it's food and drink. Your sense of smell comes into play. Your sense of taste comes into play. Your sense of hearing comes into play. The rattle of a cup and a saucer. Mm. The noise of a knife and fork on a plate. And more importantly, the human voices that accompany the use of pots, which inevitably in this kind of environment are to do with food and drink. So uh, my gallery, Corby Mora, um, Tommaso Corby Mora, who's a very kind of, I, I would say it wouldn't die, but I think he's a really good gallerist. He, unlike many people in the fine arts, he's really very aware and open to um, ceramic practice in particular. <coughs> so I think it was 216 or 14 or something. He had a year of doing what he called projects. And he said these weren't going to be the normal kind of stable of you know, artist shows, you know, from the stable of artists. And he wanted to do something different. And did I want to do a project? So I said, yes, I'd love to do a project. And the reason why was because I wanted to do a project with Tomato, because mm. he's a really interesting person. Mm. So I pitched a couple of ideas. The one we settled on, which is kind of quite ironic, because it's a 
very well regarded fine art gallery, the one we settled on was I wanted to make, I made a dinner service. Now, going back to the kind of does it pour arguments of the 70s and 80s, where you know utility is a restriction on human kind of creativity and it's a restraint and all of those kind of negative associations, um, to make a dinner service in a fine art gallery is, you know, prosaic. Tongue in cheek, my title for the show was Quotidian mm. because I was celebrating the kind of idea. But the real reason I made the show, which is one of the main drivers in fine art kind of criticism of the last 20 years, has been relational aesthetics. The idea that art should engage. So when you think of all the Tate Turbine shows over the last two decades, it's all about going along and experiencing a kind of projection that's like a sunrise, or you walk on sunflower seeds, or you go along and you smell things, or you go along and you go down a cast and holler uh, fairground mm. ride. It's all about <clears throat> art coming off the plinth, art coming out of the frame, and being relational, the term relational aesthetics. The reason why I did the dinner service with Tomato, because by definition, usable art, you call it craft or whatever, is relational. And it has this place in our lives. And it has had this place in our lives for thousands of years. And one of the great problems about showing usable art in museums or fine art galleries, such as Corby Mora, is that when you put them on display, they become separated from the very factors that give them life and meaning and kind of the, 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 the dynamic nature of engaging with them. They're static. So I said I wanted to show a dinner service, but I wanted to film it. And we had a film of a dinner, which we had about three days before the show opened. And you can, I think it may be even on this, anyway, there's a film. It's a nine minute film, which was a nine minute digest, stop frame motion of a three and a half hour meal. And it was a narrative of this occasion when, how many was it, 14 people came to, no, 16. I made an 18 piece dinner service for kind of traditional reasons, but I didn't like the proportions of 18 people on a rectangle, so it was 16. Um, came together and we broke bread. And we broke bread with our objects that, just like the turbine hall, you could handle, you could hear, you could generate stimulus for our senses. Tommaso understood that this is not a kind of traditional and rather kind of old-fashioned idea of art, but in the kind of contemporary context of the 21st century when we're struggling with the impact of digitalization and the kind of, um, you know, the atomization of society and individual experience, that, you know, this is something, this is something that I think has extraordinary relevance for life in the 21st century. Mm. I'm not looking backwards in a kind of nostalgic way. I'm actually trying to say that the notion of community and communal life and rituals that give meaning to human activity. When we eat food, it's not just about fueling the body. It's actually about breaking bread. It's about sharing food with your fellow human beings. But did you always want to do that in a fine art milieu? Because you could have been, a, I don't know, an industrial potter in that case. But you, you're not. You're, you're working in a fine art setting. And that's, <clears throat> it's not. Yes, it's a really good question. If I was an industrial potter, then the objects would be uniform. Yeah. And I'm not really interested in designing things to be mass produced in uniform. I think I did one or two mold making projects when I was at college. And then I just got bored the fact that I couldn't change the object from the mold. Okay, I made the model, I made the mold, I did the cast. Okay, well, I can really improve on that. Oh, no, I can't improve because I have to make the same thing over and over again. So I prefer to make things by hand because then I can, in my hope, develop forms in an interesting way. Everything I say about the notion of haptical art 
applies to industrial mm. ceramics as well. Mm. But those are uniform products, products which more often than not, I don't think have an enormous amount. It depends. I'd rather drink out of an industrial, a good, well-designed industrial mug than a terrible, horrible handmade one. That goes without saying. But if you have the capacity to make uh, art that can engage in this way, and also, hopefully, and this is for other people to judge, has some sort of aesthetic or kind of conceptual value, um, an expressive element, then that's a pretty, you know, in my books, that's a pretty kind of amazing combination. So the humble pot, for me, I think is the most extraordinarily complex object. Yeah. I mean, can, can, we, can I push on a little bit? Because, because we are going to run out of time otherwise, and I'm keen to involve the audience if we can. But you, you went from making, well, you, you know, domestic wear remains part of your, part of your portfolio of, of work. But then in 2011, 2012, you did this extraordinary and deeply moving project called Quietus. Hmm. Can, can we talk a, a little bit about that project, what it is, and, and also why, why you took that project on? A multitude of reasons. One comes back to this idea of art engaging with life. Um, sadly, I've experienced a lot of death in my, in my life, and I found myself at funerals at various occasions, and... We go along to celebrate someone's life. You know, it's marking the occasion of their life. We listen to beautiful music. People read prose or poetry. It takes us into areas where we can kind of think about the people and the kind of the meaning of life and one thing and another. I found myself looking at the material artifacts that accompanied death, horrible kind of coffins made of chipboard and veneer and neoclassical, sub-neoclassical Wedgwood forms. And I thought, come on, you know, surely, you know, we can improve on the kind of material, the material side of death. And so, and then, so there was that element, so there was a personal element, but then there was also that kind of element of like, you know, these objects are so impoverished and they do not live up to the task <laughs> of commemorating the life. Um, and then there's also the fact that if you look in the, if you go to the BM, I don't know, 30% of objects in the BM are to do with death. And cultures from time immemorial, and I have been to the Anthropological Museum in Bogota and God knows where, cultures use clay to make vessels, receptacles to hold the human body in death. And a huge, huge amount of ceramics. So there's an amazing precedent. Um, what's more, and I come back to this idea of the pot, the pot is such a human, it's a human art form. We talk about pots in terms of the necks, the lips, the bellies, the shoulder, the feet. Symbolically, pots, we are pots. Pots are containers, by definition. They're vessels. They're made to hold things. And more often than not, the human body is referred to as a kind of physical shell, container for the soul or the spirit, depending on whatever your kind of religious or spiritual views are. And quietus is the Latin term for the split second in, within Christian church, within Christian religion, that the soul leaves the body. That absolute moment when the body goes from a living, breathing, you know, fully formed human to, to a corpse. Mm. And, and I wanted to make an exhibition to try and show that art can mediate this incredibly difficult thing, which is becoming more and more difficult as we become a more secular culture. I don't have a faith. I don't have a religious faith. But... When you, when you want to mark something as profound as, you know, as death and you haven't got a kind of a structure, a kind of set of rituals and practices to do so, it's, it's very difficult. So Quartus was, the idea was, I'm making objects that people can use, and I hope they do do, and people do use my scenery jars. As to date, no one has asked to be buried in a sarcophagus, which is a life ambition, but anyway... Um, and um, 
it was an attempt to say art can play a part and mediate what is often being called the last great taboo, which yeah. is this very difficult subject of death. And the number of people who come up to me and said, oh, my dad died last year, and he's in this kind of yellow plastic kind of, you know, they call them funerary urns. Cinerary jar is an archaeological term. Mm. He's in this funerary urn, and it's horrible, and it's, it's nothing to do with what he was like. And, you know, three great kind of watersheds of life, you know, birth, marriage, and death. Birth and marriage are easy to celebrate because they're generally positive. Death is not. And, I, and I'm not ashamed to kind of make objects that have a role, can play a role. And whether it's, uh, if you click on that image, you, the, there's a stop frame video that uh, it probably isn't loaded, doesn't matter. You can see it on my website if you wish, to make objects that actually do have a use and I hope can kind of facilitate you know, kind of our lives. Very good. Well, look, we've done your life, we've done death, we've done pots. We haven't got done pros, and I'm very aware of the fact, <laughs> because I've been ticked off that I've been overrunning for these things. So we have five minutes, oh, six minutes and 48 seconds. I get, <laughs> I've, I've got a clock here. That's it's, what it means. And it, okay. if, I don't, if I don't hit that time, I get electrocuted, apparently, which, which isn't, <laughs> isn't great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Becky is going to be running around with a microphone. If you do, if you want to raise your hands, that would be great. We have one in the front. Just hang on for Becky. And if you can let us know who you are and what you do, Simone, the Hello. metal smith. Okay, artist. my name is Simone. <laughs> um, and I'm a metal worker. And I had the privilege to work occasionally with Julian. Julian, although I know <clears throat> quite a bit about your making, I have, uh, have observed you, I have made your work in silver, but I still wonder whether you could try to explain the construct of your making and the construct of your writing, or is it thinking, or is there a difference between all three of them? Um... Writing, uh, I'll take it in reverse order. Because as a young student and you're desperately seeking to kind of find some certainty in terms of what you make and where you position yourself mm. and you know, what you're thinking about things, I searched for a kind of historical context. As I said, I wanted to make pots, but I didn't fit into the kind of traditional kind of canon and I certainly didn't fit into the kind of postmodern canon. I was floating somewhere <coughs> in the middle. And there were all these kind of things that were said about Bernard Leach did this, and he said that, and one thing and another. And I thought, actually, this, this is just what people say. Mm. What really did happen? So I decided to kind of research it. And although I failed English A-level, if, if I'm allowed to do things slowly, I can do them. And I ended up, it turned into a PhD, and it turned into a... 100,000 word thesis, um, which was a historiography. It was a, it was, it was a thesis that was a history of writing on early English studio ceramics. And what I wanted to do was to actually, I didn't want to listen to what people said about Leach. Turned out that what they said mainly was a load of rubbish. And well, it you kind, kind of revived of, state, state Murray's reputation in, in this book, I think. It was certainly the chapter I was reading uh, this morning. Well, that's, that's good, because Stake Murray was the most important early pioneering potter by far, and he's been written out of history more often than not. So I went back and I decided to read for myself or find the material. And when people said, you know, oh, you're doing a PhD on early studio pottery, that won't take you very long, will it? That was kind of endemic of an attitude. And... For example, there were 36 reviews of studio pottery exhibitions written in times alone between 1923 and 35. Now, when I was a student, if there'd been an exhibition, a review of an exhibition of ceramics in the times, we had gone, well, hey, mm -hmm. you know, we can make it. We finally made it. But there were 36 reviews. I, it, just, I, it turned out that the big emergence of studio ceramics in Britain was... Not, not to do with Leach. Yes, he became a pivotal figure later on, 
But in a nutshell, and we have 13 minutes, three minutes left, it was a product of Britain adopting modernist ideas, pr primarily French modernist ideas, in the first 20 years of the 20th century. And it was bugger all to do with silly ideas of craft versus art. It was a new medium that was amazing because it could address the ideas that were present in this early part of the century, which was abstraction. It was to do with ideas of thinking about Eastern art, which we can't use the word Orientalism anymore, but was Orientalism in a kind of contemporaneous context. And it was to do with the vernacular revival, where you look to art made from earlier cultures, particularly in Britain, as a source of authenticity. And it was shaped by the two most important art critics in Britain in the 20th century, which was Roger Fry and Herbert Reed. Mm. And it was amazingly interesting. And I, I found material that had lain dormant for 80 years. So how did that feed in, or does it feed in? Are these parallel practices, or do the two talk to each other? It was completely liberating in terms of my practice. Right. And it was liberating because I realized that all ceramics is, or even pottery, it's just a medium, like painting or anything else. It's a bare medium that artists can do with what they like. And it's ripe for whatever you want to do with it. There's no right or wrong way of doing anything. If you can make it relevant, then great. And I think pottery has a huge relevance in the 21st century and a growing relevance in terms of the atomization of our culture, in terms of um, um, the, kind of, uh, the kind of physical isolation that we're living in. And uh, it's this dynamic, multimodal art form. And, and I just, it gave me the confidence to say, no right or wrong. Yeah. I do what I think is what I want to do for the reasons I want to do it. As to making, I'm not quite sure exactly how to answer that. Um, I don't know about making. I don't have any philosophy. I do. Knowledge. Yeah, it's all about tacit knowledge. I do get a bit fed up with people who say, oh, I make this because I like doing it. It's, as far as I'm concerned, making art has nothing to do with liking. I actually hate doing certain things because they're really, really, really difficult. But you just got to bear it to make what it is you want to make. So on, Friday, on Sunday, I was up a scaffolding tower throwing a two meter tall pot, really stressed. Because <laughs> the damn thing was wobbling and I think, what the hell am I doing? There are easier ways to kind of, but it, you know, it's all about the end result. So I don't know if that's an answer, Simone. It's gonna have to do because we've got four seconds left, Julian. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to wrap up. Uh, Thank you all very much for coming. Really appreciate it. And Julian, thank you so much for that. It was really lovely. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat>The humble pot, you say, is a complex object. No kidding. Um, gosh, we have learned so much this afternoon. We inhabit a material world because we're human you, beings. Uh, ceramics engage with us in all, our, in all our senses. It's all about community. It's all about sharing and breaking bread together. Um, it's all about aesthetic values. It's all about usage. It's all about an amazing art form. I feel we've been sitting at the feet of a giant here and uh, really has been absolutely fascinating. So let's give uh, Julian and, and Grant, who looked after us so beautifully on the stage today, a very big thank you. <laughs>